Hello and welcome back to Cloud with Chris. You're with me, Chris Reddington, and we'll be talking about all things cloud. Now, just as a reminder, I would love to have any and all topic suggestions. So please get in touch with me either on Facebook or Twitter at Cloud with Chris. I'm also working through inviting a number of people to come onto the show as a guest. So if you'd be interested in joining me for an episode, then please get in touch as well. I'm also looking to increase my presence on YouTube, so if you could subscribe to my channel, Cloud with Chris, then that would be greatly appreciated. So let's introduce episode number two. This was a suggestion from the community, so a big thank you to Garth Nibluck for this one. Last time we talked about requirements, and that cost is one dimension of that, but a very important one. When we move into a cloud world, the technology will change, but the way that we think about cost changes as well. So this episode will be called Cost Control. Let's listen in. Let's start by setting the scene. We've decided we're going to make the journey to the cloud. One of the first considerations that will be on our mind is cost, as it will likely have been a key driver for our decision to move, as is the case for many people. The important thing to bear in mind is that you shouldn't use this as the only basis for your architectural decisions. Even though cost is likely a key driver to move towards a cloud-based solution, it is not the only set of requirements you need to focus on. We spoke about requirements last time, and the importance of defining those upfront for your solution. Cost is one of those pillars. Don't let it solely guide you down a path that could eventually lead you to a path of more cost, more complexity, and potentially even misleading decisions later on down the line. What we will do throughout this episode is explore some of those mindset shifts and considerations that we need to make. So let's first start by looking into our current mindset. If we think about an on-premises world, we will think about cost in a slightly different way. We consider the costs upfront as capital expenditure and think about that as an investment upfront, often thought as a sunk cost. Now this is different in the cloud because we now pay for the costs of our cloud infrastructure on an ongoing regular basis, typically monthly, which we can then consider as an ongoing operational expenditure instead. Now, the stereotypical or the comparable example is paying your gas or electricity bills. Or maybe think of some similar service where you may pay based on what you consume, for example. This concept of pay-as-you-go reduces the strain of an upfront investment and shifts our infrastructure into a realm which resembles a commodity. So, for example, we only pay for what we use. Now, dwell on that thought for a few moments. Infrastructure as a commodity. That can be treated as an operational expense. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's not necessarily either, but from a business perspective, it does introduce opportunities as well as challenges. So on the plus side, depending on the exact nature of your business, this could bring in something valuable directly to your entire business model potentially even act as a disruptor to that model. For example, you could change your business model from a license-based approach where you sell your software to an ongoing subscription-based model, where you then have a consistent and predictable continuous revenue stream. And you could also potentially waste less cost, because each month you have the chance to assess the costs from the previous month and reduce any overheads potentially optimising your costs. However, that last point could also be considered a challenge. I often hear that the alternate approach of cloud billing, this idea of pay-per-use per per month, introduces some challenges as it's difficult to predict or estimate your potential cost. Now, while it's a challenge, I wouldn't say it's impossible. If you can implement the right operational procedures from a resource governance and a financial monitoring perspective, then the challenge does become easier to solve. 
Remember what we talked about last time? Requirements? Requirements drive everything. Think about it. One of the topics that we covered in the last episode was around having undefined requirements or loosely defined requirements. If we cannot clearly articulate the needs of the business, then the architects may overcomplicate the proposed solution to achieve some kind of worst case scenario, so very highly available system, for example, and therefore over-engineer the requirements, which then drives up cost, potentially unnecessarily. I said it enough times in the last episode, but to drive the point home, don't over-engineer services for requirements that are not clearly defined. Pause, sit back, and work with the stakeholders to determine what is more of a priority. When you show them the example costings of differing architectural approaches, they will soon be able to uh, work towards a decision and help you approach that problem. Now let's think of a tangible example. We're an organisation that focuses on retail, and we have a system that is non-essential to the ongoing business operations, based upon some kind of low service level agreement, or SLA, and unadventurous recovery objectives. In this scenario, the business has noted that cost saving is an absolute priority. It would not be appropriate for us to go for some kind of deployment where we deploy our resources in a highly available or active-active approach across Azure regions, as we would effectively be doubling the costs and potentially overcomplicating the requirements based upon the very loose context I set at the beginning there. Instead, we may want to look at some kind of single region setup, or maybe an active passive, or some kind of infrastructure as code disaster recovery approach where we can go and easily spin up new deployments in alternate zones or alternate regions if we need to. If we overcomplicated this and went for multiple regions, then we would need to factor in the additional costs of running those key resources, but also things like replication costs and data egress costs, bandwidth costs between those regions. Now we haven't yet defined in this scenario whether there is a need to communicate back to on-premises or potentially between other clouds as well. And if those are requirements, then that would potentially drive up the bandwidth costs further as well, further increasing the cost of running our solution. That's before we even talk about the compliance requirements, which could, of course, drive the overall solution in a given direction. They may, in fact, even rule out certain services as well. For example, if we need to adhere to PCI certification, then that may rule out some kind of multi-tenant option and, as a side effect, increase the cost of running our solution. And as a final thought, we want to ensure that we're using the right tool or the right service for the job. Just because we can store many different data types in a SQL database or in a document store doesn't mean we should. We should choose the right tool for the job, because if we can optimise our usage, we can typically optimise our cost alongside. So choosing the right data store for the right scenario is vital, and we'll talk more about that in another episode. Now overall, what I've talked about there is how important it is to understand our solution. Understanding our solution and what it needs to achieve is pivotal. Remember what we said last time, what the main message was of the episode. Context is key. The decision to move towards the cloud or re-architect an existing cloud-based solution gives us a great opportunity to evaluate how we are currently approaching the problem. We can then identify whether it is appropriate and adjust as needed. As we go through that analysis, we may want to consider some key questions. For example, is the workload sized appropriately? Commonly, I see that customers migrating from on-premises servers find that they can reduce the specs, so the CPU and the RAM, of the machines that they are running on because they are over-provisioned for the purpose that they're serving. This wasn't a problem in an on-premises world because we've already paid for that cost up front. However, because we pay that cost every month in the cloud, it is something that we now want to optimise for. You will typically find that optimising performance or fine-tuning your specifications could delight you in your next bill. So let's consider the scenario where you have 10 virtual machines, or maybe 10 instances of some platform as a service option, that each run an individual service, and nothing more. Could we potentially leverage an architectural pattern known as compute resource consolidation? Compute resource consolidation is a fancy way of saying 
can we run those components on a smaller amount of compute, which would therefore cost us less to run the workload overall? So in this context, rather than running 10 instances, could we run the 10 components across perhaps two instances to save on cost and do some kind of co-location? Remember what I said earlier though, this needs to be taken into consideration with the wider requirements, not compromising any availability requirements as part of this decision. A concrete example of this would be to transition from 10 virtual machines or 10 instances towards an approach where we run those 10 services on fewer virtual machines, or as an alternative, we could containerize those services and run them as pods on a Kubernetes cluster. Fundamentally, what we are doing is we are increasing the density of the components deployed on those virtual machines and thereby reducing cost. Can the workload scale? Commonly people think of scalability from a performance perspective, but think for a moment of an infrastructure as a service based workload or an on-premises workload. They tend to be quite static and designed to handle peak load scenarios, so are provisioned at a level where it can handle the full amount of expected load. Instead, what if we can optimise to the usage patterns of the application? These usage patterns could either be driven by a time factor, so some kind of seasonality, maybe by certain time of the day, days of a week, or certain periods of a year, or by metrics generated by the underlying infrastructure, such as CPU, percentage, queue length, etc. Now whilst we're covering scalability, we should cover off the difference between scaling up and down compared with scaling out and in. Consider that our workload runs on an individual machine. That machine will have certain amounts of RAM and CPU associated with it. On premises, we would commonly think about scaling up that machine, so increasing the amount of RAM or CPU in that machine because we only have a finite amount of space in our data center. As a result, we would find that we love and care for those machines just like we would a pet, for example. Now this is the same as changing the SKU of a virtual machine that we're using in the cloud, or the SKU of a platform as a service option, for example. Scaling down is the opposite concept, so taking that larger machine size and reducing its capability. So reducing the amount of CPU, the amount of RAM that the machine has, or changing to a lower SKU in the cloud. Now in contrast, scaling out is the idea where we add more machines to solve a problem, also known as adding more instances. We therefore have many workers, or machines, performing the same task in parallel. Once the task is complete, we can then scale in, so remove those instances, to ensure we have the appropriate amount of instances and resource needed to solve the current level of load. This mindset shift is typically because of the constraints that we had in an on-premises environment, where we had fixed space in our data centers. In the cloud, we have an abundance of compute available to us. So we have this luxury of being able to throw more machines at a problem. If this is for a small amount of time and the workload is quite bursty, then it's likely to be more cost effective to scale out for the time where we need that extra compute, run the workload as we need to at that level of instances, and then bring it back in, rather than run the workload at a higher skew for an ongoing period of time. This also allows us to start thinking about deploying our workload as a stamp and having different performance tiers of our application, so bronze, silver, gold, or low, medium, high loads, and being able to deploy those across different regions and predictably be able to determine the level of loads that certain deployments may be able to handle. Now let's revisit the retail scenario from earlier. Your workload may have some kind of usage pattern. So they commonly use the solution between 9 to 5 on business days in a specific geographic region. Are there spikes at certain times of the year? Given that we're a retailer, Black Friday could be a prime example of that. Or are there common peaks? For example, is it a payroll system and we see more users accessing the system to access their payslips around payday every month? Each of the cloud providers has some concept of auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is this idea that we can trigger a scaling event to react upon some kind of metric or proactively scale the number of instances based upon the current day or the current time. This starts us along our journey from treating infrastructure as pets and thinking about infrastructure as ephemeral or temporary, and as some refer to it, treating the infrastructure as cattle. So given this variable nature of cloud deployments, we also need to be aware that the level of load that we see in the application may of course grow over time. This will of course mean that our costs may increase over time as well in line with that. 
as we need more instances to deal with the increased level of load that the application is serving. This does bring an interesting question. If we think about that, what happens if we get a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack? There is some indirect damage that those kind of attacks could do from a cost perspective, as well as the direct damage that they can do towards the availability of a workload and the brand impact for an organisation. This is why autoscale rules typically have a maximum number of instances so that you can control the boundaries, you know, the minimum and the maximum number of instances you would expect to run, and why the main cloud providers have some kind of DDoS protection service, some of which even have some cost guarantees in there as well, so they're worth evaluating and checking out. So let's pause for a moment and think what we've discussed so far. We've looked at the mindset shift, moving from a capital expenditure model to an operational expenditure approach. We have once again reviewed the importance of requirements, and also the value in assessing our workload's current state and how we can potentially optimise for a cloud cost model. Once we apply those changes, we then need to understand how to estimate costs of running the workload and then measure that on an ongoing basis. Each of the cloud providers has some kind of pricing calculator. These tools are your friends and are well worth familiarising yourself with. Use these tools in parallel when you are designing your solutions. Whilst they're not going to give you a 100% accurate cost, they will give you a rough order of magnitude in the costings of your application and give you the ability to discuss some kind of bronze, silver, gold approach to help identify with your key stakeholders which solution is right. I often hear people talk about the fact that they can't estimate their cost because of the degree of variability and the scalable nature of their solution. I agree that this can be challenging, but it is not impossible. If you are bringing an existing workload, then you will have an idea of roughly how many instances you need to run and the level that you currently run it at today, and can use that as an initial basis of cost. For example, the number of instances required and the types of SKUs that you may need. You may need to add extra services along the way, and this may evolve over time, as you may expect from your architecture. Now you need to make sure that you factor in any extra environments into your costings. Most people think about dev and test and production, but what about the cost of any disaster recovery environments? This of course depends on whether you'll be running it as an active-active, active-passive, or deploying new infrastructure by code in a disaster scenario, for example. But the key bit here is making sure that you plan this up front. Alongside that, operational procedures are crucial. Who is responsible for tracking your spend at the individual application level, the wider project level, and at the overall organisation level? Each of those individuals will have a different viewpoint that they will be looking at the cost from, and looking at it from a different perspective. All of the cloud providers have some form of tooling to help you with this, whether you can set budgets and set alerts on those budgets, for example, so that you can proactively determine if you are approaching some kind of limit that you have set. Now, whilst I use the word limits, those are generally soft limits, as cloud providers don't really want to risk stopping any of your production workloads. So that's up to you to then take some action to actually go ahead and stop the workload if you need to because of costs. Now, that point leads us on to the importance of good governance practices. In particular, being able to associate your resources with some kind of metadata information so that you can report back on the metrics that are most important and most relevant to you. For example, do you care on reporting the usage of costs from an environment perspective, so dev, test, and prod? Do you care about which microservices cost the most to run, or which team is running the highest bill? Now on that last point, just because a team has a high monthly cost month on month doesn't mean they're doing a bad job. If they're running the core platform infrastructure that is underpinning a number of your business critical applications, you would likely expect that to cost more due to the resilience concerns if it went down. So you need, again, to look at this in the right perspective and in the right context. Thinking on governance, we should also consider things like policies. Are there certain rules or items that we can enforce or get the platform to automatically apply? or audit for us so that we can ensure there is a base level of information being captured about our resources, or potentially that we're restricting what our users can actually go and do. And overall, when you think about the things that we're talking about here, we're taking some concepts that we know from DevOps. In particular, being data-driven, 
we are now billed every month, which means that if we see a spike in cost in one month, we can take action, remediate and address any potential issues so that the cost is optimised for the next month. Before we wrap up, let's think of a few final quick and easy wins to reduce costs directly in our workload. Is there the potential to optimise and use something like a low priority or a spot instance? If the workload doesn't need some kind of guaranteed compute and can rely on these types of low cost instances to burst, then that could be a great way to save on costs. Can you commit a certain amount of money up front? If you can predict the number of instances that you will need, then you may be able to use some kind of offer that cloud providers typically have around using reserved instances, which will allow you to gain good discounts. Typically, cloud providers will also have some kind of deal or subscription for workloads which are not running in production, where you can also shave some of those costs off as well. This does typically mean, though, that you will forfeit any formal SLA on resources being used in that context. So do be mindful of that trade-off. Can you transfer any kind of licensing benefits that you get elsewhere into your cloud deployment? So for example, if you're running a virtual machine and the software you're running in that virtual machine requires some kind of license, could you potentially save some of that cost by porting existing licenses that you have and just pay for the underlying infrastructure rather than the bundled license and infrastructure cost? Remember to provision resources starting on a smaller tier and scale up or scale out as needed, again, focusing around your requirements. So on that note, regularly review the components that you are using and make sure you are using them effectively. We have covered a lot of ground on points to consider from a cost perspective. Make sure that your requirements are driving your decisions and remember that cost is just one of those pillars. Make sure that you are treating your resources as a commodity because then that enables you to deeply understand your workload and the nuances of how you may be able to optimise, such as right-sizing or using scale-in and out capabilities, rather than having some kind of static workload. Be data-driven. Regularly review your usage alongside your budgets and factor that into your backlog so that you can optimise where appropriate. Thank you for joining me on this episode. As always, I appreciate your feedback and would love to hear from you. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or would like to join me as a guest, then please just get in touch. You can do that either on Twitter or Facebook at Cloud with Chris. And finally, please don't forget to check out and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Cloud with Chris. Until next time, goodbye.